I thought I'd start off by showing you my very first ever mosaic. This is actually the alchemical symbol for unity. It represented me, my husband, and my child, first child, Poppy. My partner at the time did landscape gardening, so he designed this area for me to mosaic. I'm actually lying, it's my second mosaic, because the first time, for the first three weeks I worked on this project, I stuck all the tiles down the wrong way. <laughs> and it took my partner three weeks to point that out to me. And I can tell you that this mosaic has lasted longer than that relationship. <laughs> but anyway, so as soon as I did mosaicing, I was probably like a lot of you, it just, I'd done sculpture, but as soon as I did mosaic, it was the joy of the physically making it, and I realized that it was incredibly meditative for me. I am the most impatient person you'll ever meet. If you spend time with me, you will realize that I'm very hyper. And so for mosaicing, it was something that calmed me down, and I could totally see how this was a very useful uh, medium to use with other people. And in 98, my friend Karen, who I was at college with, she said to me, I'm moving to Leeds. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm moving to Crewe, because it's really cheap there. And uh, I've been given this bus station that's due for demolition, but they've said, that if you have a look, we could have one of the shop units. They would give us a £5,000 grant, grant and let us do anything we wanted to do with it because it was due to be knocked down and so I thought yes I'm there as you can see it was pretty horrible it was used I mean it's the main bus station in Crewe and this is what it looked like but that six weeks lasted into six months I lived there for six months and a team of about four of us we covered the whole place in mosaics. This is using, these are the first ever community mosaics I ever did. Um, and these were all done by special needs. They were done by the local kids. They were done by anyone who was waiting for a bus. <laughs> and we covered the whole area. This is all the tree of life. It was just, it was just a joy. And this is one of my first ever mosaics after a community, a public one, and uh, as you can see, I was very interested in Aztec and Mayan art. I always have been. That actually represents the god of drunkenness, which is another reason why I'm no longer with my first husband. And we formed a group called Living Space Arts, and for ten years we were community mosaic artists. And uh, this is me. I, as I said, I got into mosaics late. I've actually got a degree in sculpture. I studied fine art at Leeds. This is possibly, I think, the only public art sculpture I've ever done. If you think it's called Twelve Tribes and it's pigs painted human flesh colour, you'll probably realise why it's the only piece of public art I've ever done. <laughs> as far as I know, after this went up in Leeds crew, in, in crew bus station, it became known as Bacon Alley. <laughs> But the one thing I discovered in crew is that if you're not being paid to do something, generally you get to do what you like. And if you are being paid to do something, then there's someone being paid more than you to oversee what you're doing, just to check. Um, as you can see, we didn't just do uh, mosaics. We put um, sculptures up. We put lanterns up. We totally changed the whole area. Um, I'd looked at Google just before I came here to give this talk to see if they were still there. The actual bus station still exists. It's now painted blue. But um, I know that for a fact that our art lasted, I think, eight years. So it wasn't bad. But two years later, I saw uh, there was an advert asking for artists to go to Romania to work in an orphanage. And um, I applied with Living Space Arts, and we were chosen to go unbelievably with World Emergency Relief, which is a right-wing, fundamental Christian charity. <laughs> but the woman who ran it liked me, so she took us. And this is the orphanage in Tigvin. This is actually the school. So this is, looks quite nice. Where these children actually lived was like a bomb shelter. You've never seen anything like it. And these were some of the kids that we worked with. I mean. This was an orphanage that you saw about. You, you saw this on the news at the time. These were kids that were sexually, physically, and mentally abused. I mean, they had never really been held, 
It was just a ghastly, ghastly place to go to. And when we arrived, they said, you can work with about 10 of our kids. You can work with the 10 best kids. I mean, one of the questions they kept saying is, why are you here? Why don't you work with the good schools? Why are you here? Why would you want to work with these children? Because they really were perceived as less than human. And the only way you can understand that is that in very poor places, they have to dehumanise other people. Because if you can't feed your own kids, the thing you do is you have to, de you know, you have to cut yourself off from the reality of that there's other people who are starving. And so it was a very brutal place. But we insisted that we worked with every child in that school, and we did. I think it was about 150 special needs kids. And for some, it was just a question of being in a room with us and playing with paint. And, and you have to understand that if you imagine seeing a child that's never seen paint and they see that red and yellow makes orange, imagine seeing that to 150 kids who've also never really been held, loved, been treated in a nice way. And it had a terribly profound effect on all of us that went there. And this is me with a girl called Sabrina. She was a very special case. When she came to us, she was hunched back. We were told that she was probably blind, not to expect much from her. She was clearly the kind of runt in her age group. She was, didn't really speak. She was very nervous. But the minute she was given paint, we realized that she was an artist. You've never seen a child respond so, so intently to the process. She just couldn't stop. She was so gifted. This is her holding her first ever painting. And, and to see her statue, we went, I think it was two or three times. Over that period of time, she started to stand up. She went from being like this to standing up. And everybody else started to talk to her. This is Christine, another lovely child. And I just wanted to show these, to show you the joy on their faces. The joy of creating. The funny thing is, is when we went to Romania the first time, it's so corrupt a country that none of our materials arrived. <laughs> Nothing. You have to pay so many people to get them that we just didn't have time to bribe the officials. Sorry, so the only thing that we could actually work with was enamel paint that we got from some kind of building shop, which was really toxic. One thing you don't have to worry about here is health and safety. <laughs> And so here are the kids with their first ever paintings. And all these paintings went up in the corridor. Here is the uh, director. This is Tona, who actually was a really good guy. He'd fought to get carpets in this building because they argued, why would you put carpets with these kids? And he'd fought. He'd fought very hard. And that's why he'd brought us in here. And that's Mark, who's worked with me for the last 15 years, um, presenting him with a painting for his office. And here are some local people helping to install those paintings. And I wanted to include that to show you the kind of the energy that was created at that time. That was groups of people coming together. This was our last day, the first time that we went. This is 2000. And the whole idea of this project is that we were going to go back every six months. We were going to train teachers there in how to do art. And it was going to become an integrated part of this orphanage and we went back six months later, this time with our materials. And you can see the kind of change in the classroom. Up until the point that we arrived with these kids, their only education was to sit in a room and draw dots in a row. That's all they did. They all sat in a room and they all drew dots in a row. And suddenly we came, we came with paint and we came with colour. And, and the thing is, is that it was very unusual even by normal standards to have this level of art within a community. And so outside, people started to hear about what we were doing. The local TV came to make a film. We were in the local paper. And I don't know if you've noticed, but these kids have gone from wearing numbers on their T-shirts to having uniforms. Somewhere, as soon as the TV crew were coming, they got uniforms. There was suddenly a collective pride that went on, where they'd gone from hiding these people away and not talking about these kids to suddenly the local mayor wanting to come and see what amazing work these kids were producing. 
Um, when I went the second time, I actually took my daughter, that's Poppy, and we actually took four children between three of us, including a nanny, to look after them. And I, and I wanted my own child to see what conditions other children actually live in, and we wanted these children to feel a connection to us, that we were making links with them. Not only did we take paint, though, we took mosaics. And if you think watching these kids play with paint was something, seeing them play with tiles is just unbelievable. Because, as has been said before, I think there is an innate quality with all of us, the tactile and the feel of tiles. And for some of these kids, they would just spend 20 minutes touching the tiles, just holding them. It was just amazing. When you go to these kind of places, there's often a child who makes that special link to you. You can't help it. And this is Christina, and this was the person who really broke my heart. I spent many nights at home crying that I couldn't adopt her. She followed me around the entire time I was there calling me mummy. But she was such a joy to be around. And here they are, busy grouting their mosaics. And this is them, one of them holding up their sign they made that said Tigving. It's not a very good photo, but it says special school. I've always thought it very important to make signs, have signages for people to have pride in what they are and who they were. We also work with Romanian gypsies and the gyp they have their own flag that's never seen anywhere. So we actually mosaic a flag for them at the refugee camps. And that kind of idea of, of, of recognising who they are and making it important... And so this is some of the finished mosaics we did. We asked them, what did you want? And they said they wanted scenes of nature. So some of it was a mixture of fantasy worlds and real worlds, but the kids wanted birds, they wanted flowers, they wanted things that were beautiful. This is a painting that they'd worked on, which was a scene of a jungle where they'd all worked on pieces that went up on the side of the wall. And here are some of the finished mosaics that we did with the kids. This is one of my favourite photos. This is Karen, who had first invited me to crew. She was at college with me and then uh, came to Romania with me. And here's me with Christina. But also, there's always a moment when you have to leave. And that's a terribly sad time. It's really hard. It's really hard emotionally to go to these places, to bring a light, and then to recognise the fact that you are going away. And it was deeply painful for us to, to leave these children. I mean, when we left the second time, some of them were rocking and hitting themselves and showing very, very clear signs of distress. And as a, as a person, I never quite knew of what I was doing was a good thing or a bad thing. But one thing I know is that when they saw us cry, they couldn't believe it. They said, you're crying about us, you care. I think just having an outside person come and, and show an emotion and show that they really cared about them was a positive thing for some of these children. In, uh, when Romania joined the um, Europe, part of its condition was that it would close down all its orphanages. And for some of those kids, they were sent to worse conditions to worse places, some just went into hospital, but some of them were resettled and went back to live independently in the community. And she was one of those people. And I like to think that us working with her, and more importantly, working with the community to see the true potential of what these children could do, helped in a small part to helping that situation happen and helping them be reintegrated. Because I think the most important thing we did was come out, come as outsiders into a very terrible place, but to allow the art allowed other people to see the true potential of these children and to see, the, to see what they were capable of. And I think that's one of the things that art is. It's a lever, whereas lots of people have views about things and it's very black or white. Art is that thing where you can open up a lovely little channel of communication and people are sometimes caught off guard through art and culture. So anyway, this is my house. I just wanted to <laughs> show you that in between these two times, I have actually become a mad eccentric mosaicist who will mosaic, 
Well, mosaic anything, if it's stationary for long enough. That's my car, my house. This is the back of my house. Uh, this is the elephant that we were talking about. This was for... Um, um, this actually was made by five artists working for three months, working about ten hours a day, seven days a week, totally unpaid. Um, again, it gave us the freedom to... The other side you can't see, but it's got a skeleton. No, I didn't bring it. I'm sorry. But I didn't just do one elephant. I did a double-headed one for Milan. This was called Bunga Bunga after Bellasconi, but they banned it. They wouldn't allow me to have that title. So it actually became Little Miss DMT, which is actually the drug that I took that inspired this work. <laughs> Little fact there. She actually has... Um, she actually has The Revolution Is Now written on all her four ears in Italian, which was pretty spot on because when that hit the Museum of Modern Art in Milan, the students started to riot the next day. So there you go. But this was made by a team of... Um, I did all the headdress bit, but all of the white was made by people who'd never mosaic before. They all came to my studio and mosaic, and um, it was it's a good piece. OK, I'm nearly there. You're all right. Uh, not just elephants. Don't just stick at elephants. This is a horse. This was uh, for the Cheltenham Art Museum, who stupidly gave me a horse to mosaic, <laughs> not knowing that my partner's an animal rights campaigner. So <laughs> this horse was on display at Cheltenham Horse Racing. I went to the Cheltenham Cup or something like that, where I had to be... People actually shouted at me, <laughs> demanding to know how I ever was allowed to make this piece. And they haven't been able to sell it. They don't know what to do with it. It's like a white elephant, but it's actually a Trojan horse. And it sits, <laughs> it sits in um, an arcade on the outskirts of Cheltenham while they try to decide what to do with it. It actually has on it names and shames every horse that has died in Cheltenham races. <laughs> this is probably one of my most favorite Personally, my favourite piece is this is um, for Mary Bamber, an unknown suffragette. It was commissioned in Leeds. It was meant for as a, as a semi-temporary piece, but it was bought by the Museum of Liverpool and now is on permanent display. I actually made a tile to commemorate every single known woman in Merseyside who'd fought for the women's rights. And I'm, because that's now in Liverpool, I think that the women's, those women are now honoured in Liverpool. That was the only piece I ever got paid for, by the way. Um, this is now my kind of personal work. Um, I mosaic bonnets. This was made for the Queen's Jubilee. As you can tell, I'm not a royalist. <laughs> but what I'm most... I mean, what I actually think is what I most enjoy is community work and going to areas and doing art. And some of you might know that I was supposed to give a talk here last year. <laughs> And I didn't, I blew you all out. But I have a very good reason, and that's because I was in Mexico. And if you were to go to Mexico City and travel as far away from the city as you could, you would get to a mountain top, which is called Mirror Valley. This is one way. And if you turn around and look the other way, this is what you would see. It's right on the top of the mountain. It's an incredibly poor barrio, very poor was set up about 27 years ago. Just people who arrived in Mexico had nowhere to go, so they went to the outskirts and built their own town. But it's, it's run along revolutionary principles. It's all sustainable. They grow their own food. They provide 200 low-cost meals a day. They've built their own school. They've built their own library. And me and the lovely Lucinda, Lady Lucinda Wilde, who's in the audience there, we were invited to go out there originally for nine days, but we stayed there three weeks, hence my non-attendment last year at BAM. And uh, these were two people that we went to try and work with to set up a project. One of them called Miguel, who was an ex-gang member who turned his life around and become the artist. And he was there working with young people. The other guy is Daniel, who was the paid tutor to help kids. Of course, of course, because of our language barrier, I didn't realise till about week two that he wasn't just another gang member. <laughs> but 
I think in a way it, it helps to not know what you're dealing with because you kind of go in there all naive and nice and happy. Um, and this is just to show you like what the local walls were. It was covered in graffiti and things. So we asked, people came along, volunteered, and they came up with this design, which was just a joy for me, as you can tell from my earlier work. This is what they wanted to mosaic on the front of their community building. And here they are, making a template. They'd built this whole community building themselves. And here are the drawings for the work. And this is all the local high school. They just all came in to help. No idea how that lady's still in high school, by the way. That was another <laughs> total mystery to us because they, they don't seem to have age requirements at their schools. But it was a school that was renowned for taking kids who'd been excluded. Kids who'd done... Um, I don't think she's... It was supposed to take people who'd done, sold drugs and things, but I don't think she's one of them. And here's... Lady Lucinda Wilde showing them how to do their first mosaics. And you can see here again how much pleasure it gave people to join in and to work collectively to do things. I've, I've worked in many schools in, and I have never worked with such engaged children as I met over in Mexico. Wow. I don't know any school that you could go to in London where if the kids would come up and ask you what, you, what can we do to help? And if you said, can you go through that rubbish bin and sort out all of the bottle tops, they would do it with, happily. They, you know, they happily would do anything. They were the most engaged, happy children I've ever come across. And uh, because this place it actually recycled all the plastic, two tonnes of plastic for Mexico City was recycled in this area, and they turned it into to the most amazing furniture, because a German artist had already been there and brought a process that enabled them to recycle plastic, we thought uh, uh, it would be a good idea to try and recycle their bottle tops, because they had hundreds of them. <laughs> this is Oscar, who actually, he's the guy who ran the plastic place. He was considered an entrepreneur. <laughs> Of Mexico. I've realized that to be an entrepreneur in Mexico means you just have to be punctual. If you turn, <laughs> you just have to turn up on time. Um, we had, I think we spent two weeks or just, we had about three weeks on this project. Bear in mind that for four days our tiles never arrived. It was always manana, manana. In fact, we had to send them down physically in a truck just to get our mosaics. And uh, this is a de detailed one, so you can see, I've spent about the last eight years studying how to transfer image onto tile, because for me, I want to, I've always wanted to have meaning in my own mosaics, and I would like to add layers of detail, and I want to be political and didactic and all those things, and I'd been speaking to the artist who arranged for me to go over, and I asked him, what would you like, and he wanted revolutionaries, and they wanted revolutionaries on tiles so even though you can't see it in the other pictures you can see that it's very loaded with imagery and here it is with the bottle tops this was amazing because this enabled kids even the, the kids from the special needs school just to come and be free you don't have to tell them what you're doing or you just enabled them to stick it down um, the color is just amazing i've no idea if this is going to last it's kind of an it's an experiment both me and Linda are desperate to go back so we can just see how it's faded in bright sunlight or if it's still there. This is Daniel working on his own piece. You know, as soon as we taught them the skill, they just ran with this. They just, they're very skilled people and they were very talented artists. And as soon as we gave them, explained to them how to do this, they just made the most amazing work. I mean, our biggest problem was dealing with, with the conditions. It was boiling hot. The first mosaic we attempted to put up, the grout had, the adhesive had dried before we'd put the single tile on the wall. <laughs> and also we had to deal with a very macho environment where they wouldn't talk to me or Linda. They would talk to the person next to us. <laughs> but we were kind of blanked and it was quite difficult. Don't speak Spanish, don't speak to women, boiling hot. But it's almost like, Getting over all these adversaries is what makes these projects so amazingly special. And this is the mosaic going up. This is their sign. I mean, again, it was that question of putting a sign, putting a name, making it, uh, you know, showing people who they were. This is all based 
on um, ancient Aztec and Mayan ideas. I can't remember them, but I know that they exist. And here's some of the people in front of the sign that they put up on the wall. And this is the finished work. And this is detail. And to someone who was talking about the not putting mosaics into the Tate, my tagline has always been turn a prize reject. I wear it as a badge of honour that they don't want us. And I would suggest that we go en masse and do a Banksy gorilla type thing and stick them up in there. <laughs> and then send an article to the press. But they're two of my favourite sayings, I'm an artist, your rules don't apply. But I'm thinking after today to say, I'm a craftsperson, your rules don't apply. But so, yes, I was pleased. I have my Turner Prize reject right up on a hill in Mexico. And the other reason I chose this is because I was so pleased that the artist who designed this wanted to make sure that you knew that that was a girl. It was a goddess. <laughs> That's why she's got lovely big boobies. You can tell it was two women who went to do this project. <laughs> and so this is the finished one. Unbelievably, neither me or Linda bothered to take a photo of the finished work. This is the only photo I have with rubbish thrown all in front of it. And that's because we worked right up until Day of the Dead. Right up. And we lost our entire workforce about a week beforehand, and we couldn't understand where they'd all gone. About two days beforehand, they'd all disappeared, and then we realised that they were building our friendos all around the town. And of course, they weren't going to help us. They had their own things to do. So me and Linda had to finish this ourselves, get ready, rush down, come back. And the most beautiful thing is, is this was the community centre, but it was mainly used by the youth and they didn't really go up there. I mean, why would you? It's full of kids who play rock musicians. You know, they did rock music there and made stuff. But on the Day of the Dead, the November the 1st, they had a great big assembly down in the town centre, but they all came up with lanterns and were led up in a procession to see what we'd been doing for the last three weeks, these weird women from England. And uh, they all came up in, at night time with lanterns where inside we had an exhibition of all the work that we'd done and they came to see this and, and luckily they liked it. <laughs> and it was just a very magical moment because we realised that in a way it, it given a reason for all the other people down in the town to come and to, to take ownership over this community centre and be proud of it. And the most amazing thing, you can see from the colour there that when you're down in this town... All you can see is these flames <laughs> on the top of the mountain. Um, I, me and Linda sent them, set them a project that we wouldn't come back unless they did some more mosaics because we were worried that without us there, they'd just go back to doing what they do. And uh, we waited and waited and waited and then thought, well, that was a nice project. But a, a month ago, I got this picture. A month ago, it's, it's taken eight months, but they have done some. And seeing as they've never done mosaics before, you have to see how they've taken this and run with it, you know, the, the way that they've done it. I'm most pleased to see Che Guevara there. <laughs> but, yes, so... And this is Oscar showing that he has started to put them up. And only two days ago, Oscar sent me this. These are his first ever mosaics of him, that he's done himself. And I think you can see, uh, you know, how amazing this work is. Yes, mad in England. But I think you can see just how, you know, me and Linda went there for two weeks. We showed them some most basic skills and how much that's left behind. And here's just, this is just a poster. As far as I know, that they've gone from strength to strength. They've now won a, an award and a grant to fund their tutor that's still there. They seem to have done out the youth centre. So it, it's been a really positive, positive project. And I suppose I want to end by saying that for me, I've always believed that, you know, in the same way that it's a right to have decent housing and a right to have decent health and a right to decent education... I think it's a right that we should be able to go and decorate and beautify our areas and our neighbourhoods and that we should all be able to go out there and 
cover our schools and our homes and anything in mosaics. It would be such a nicer world that we lived in if we did. But all rights have to be fought for. If you know your history, you know that they don't give us anything unless we fight for it, which is why I've always said you've got to fight for your right to be arty. Thank you. <laughs>